If I were to distill the four ingredients of writing and the four reasons people come for writing coaching, it starts like this. Memory, imagination, observation, questions about the world and ourselves in it. We come to the blank page to work stuff out and in doing so to connect. I'm Rachel Knightley. Welcome to the Writer's Gym. Last episode, you heard me talking to John Paul Flintoff about how our background in improvisation and theatre informed how we work as writers and as speakers. It has an amazing overlap today, talking about the idea of saying yes, as I discuss writing lives with Maura McHugh. Maura McHugh was born in the USA, but raised in Ireland, where she developed a love of mythology, horror fiction, art and writing. She has lived in New York, Dublin and Galway and worked in IT before succumbing to her love of storytelling. She co-wrote the comic book Witchfinder, The Mysteries of Unland with Kim Newman and is working on a variety of comic book stories in the 2000 AD universe. She's the author of the fairy tale collection Twisted Fairy Tales and the collection of world myths Twisted Myths. Her collections of original short stories, The Bows Withered, is published by Newcon Press and was nominated for a British Fantasy Award for Best Collection. Her non-fiction exploration of Twin Peaks, Fire Walk With Me, was nominated for a British Fantasy Award for Best Non-Fiction. She's also a published poet, a produced playwright and a screenwriter, and often appears on Irish radio discussing pop culture. She loves exploring the woods. The darker, the wilder, the better. Saying yes is a very important piece of advice to actors because you take the idea that's in front of you and you add, you say yes and. Today is all about writing careers and Maura's advice is exactly that, saying yes. You will feel lack of confidence in new areas, you will feel lack of experience, but people will help you and you will learn and the job and the people will contribute to that writing life. I wanted to talk about writing lives because one of the things that so many of my coaches look at and find it hard to imagine and therefore hard to create is what they want their writing lives to look like. Mine doesn't look like being at a desk every day, some people's do, and I hope today helps you work out what you want yours to look like. If at any time you can hear the mowing, please do let me know. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's really good. They've got a lot closer to the building now and they just (laughs) would, wouldn't they? (laughs) But this is the summer though, you know, it's, um, yeah, I mean, I live in the countryside, so like randomly out of nowhere, there could be a truck, there could be people with chainsaws buzzing down hedges, you know, stuff like that happens all the time around here. Uh, So I never know. I mean, technically, it's a very quiet environment until it isn't. Until there's a chainsaw. Yeah. And during the summer, as you said, mowing all the goddamn time. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. People are obsessed with their bloody lawns. (laughs) Waste time and bad for the environment. (laughs) Yeah. And the resistance against against nature generally. I, I, I am quite enjoying the idea that it's quiet except for the chainsaws. I feel like we're massively on, on genre there. <laughs> quiet <laughs> place to live. We had a wonderful series of messages about what it is and means and looks like to be a full-time writer. I might just fill you in with how I came to be thinking about this quite so much now as you know loads of writing coaches and some of them are published and some of them are unpublished and what absolutely everyone has in common aside from the feeling that somebody else has got all the right answers and is doing it better because you know human (laughs) the the idea of what writing full-time looks like is Mm. a big thing it's not new to most people the idea that fame does not equal money or that mm-hmm. visibility does not equal financial stability obviously with coaches I want to be aware of what my blind spots are so I don't push them onto other people mm-hmm. and definitely one for me is I like the fact that my particular jigsaw of being a freelancer started the way it did so it's not all all writing and it's not all on my own that even before I was doing writing coaching A lot of it was one-to-one confidence coaching through theatre, through public speaking. And that wasn't 
very severe quote marks wasn't writing now the truth of it is that yes it of course was because yeah. public speaking and how you express yourself and how you get the obstacles out of the way of expressing yourself all of those are so very deeply linked but at the same time there is a difference in that there are writers out there who would hear about what I do and go Ugh, that's not writing writing is me in my own world in my pajamas nobody gets to see it or be in here so mm. it, the writing mm. lives can look very different and mm. I, I guess that's a roundabout way of saying mm. that there's a massive spectrum isn't there of, of what full-time writer can mean to people yeah there is I mean some people if they're working part-time as a writer part-time could be like 40 hours to them you know which is veering into full-time work. <laughs> but all of us have multiple lives. I mean, it's very interesting what you're talking about, the demarcations. Often they're very artificial that we have created in our mind about what is writing and non-writing. For instance, a great deal of what writers have to deal with is admin. You know, this is something that's never talked about, which is, you know, people want to interview you. No offense, this is fine. But <laughs> actually written interviews, podcasting, actually, I love doing because you sit down, you talk, it's a conversation, it's beautiful. I love chatting to people. But there's a lot of interviewing you might do via text, you know, there's emails, there's arrangements, there's chasing money, there's looking at contracts, there's actually a kind of irritating amount of admin that must be completed every day, responding to emails, not responding to emails, thinking about responding to emails, <laughs> putting it off responding to emails. <laughs> this takes up a huge amount of mental space. And in some ways, there seems to be so many obstacles some days to actually writing physical typing now I'm talking about or in some cases that might be using voice to text now you know the mm. way way things are going I was thinking about this a lot recently because we're both on Substack and you know what do you perceive as your real writing as opposed to say communicating with the public by a podcast or performance or coaching versus writing which is then fiction what's non-fiction I do think this is probably detrimental to the writer long term because you've this very narrow bit of writing that you have labeled writing and you've all this other stuff around it labeled non-writing and then you are flagellating yourself for not getting to the proper writing mm -hmm. and you do need to sort of prioritize that as best you can but I think that sense of you know, oh, this isn't the real stuff. It really means that you've given yourself something to be annoyed with about yourself and you're fighting yourself as well. And the crazy thing about writing is so much of it is internal and your mental well-being is really important <laughs> as a result. And uh, if you make these, you know, whipping boys in your mind, then you're in trouble long term. You know, you have to figure out some way to be and which is something that I'm working. I've been working on very consistently over the last couple of years is being kind to yourself and compassionate to yourself and understanding you're doing your best. And while also trying to keep yourself focused, I wanted to grab a couple of those things and I could spend hours on so much of what you've said there. But in order to have a bit of a timeline did you always know you were a writer? Did you always know you wanted that to be the job? Yeah, the I okay, so I always wanted to do some writing, but I was not one of these people who, who you know, you hear and they're like, yeah, I was writing from the age of six. Now, I was actually doing writing of that nature, but never, ever with any intention except to entertain myself, you know, and I wasn't doing it anyway consistently. And it wasn't really until my 20s that I started harboring, my early 20s, I started writing uh, stuff, creating things in my own little universes. And, but again, I had labeled it as not writing, you know, as in it wasn't published, therefore it's not writing. <laughs> so 
I took me quite a while, like many arts graduates, because I did a, a master's in Irish supernatural fiction. And then I went into the real world and got a career and did some more academic work and then ended up in IT, which is the career of choice for arts graduates. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I actually didn't really start really putting the pedal down consistently until I was in my uh, early 30s. And then I went, probably the big moment for me is I went to Clarion West in America, which is a residential workshop. It's very, it's like a hothouse. I mean, if it was a reality show, it would be mm -hmm. crazy to have the cameras everywhere, but you have to write a short story every week. You have to criticize everyone else's work. And there's like 18 of you living in one house, you know? So it's, uh, it's very intense. And that's when I when I got into there and when I did that work, that's when I was like, OK, I'm not I'd already decided I was going to give this a proper shot, but that gave me the confidence to keep going. And I actually made my first a story I wrote there it ended up being quite good for me. It sort of sold. Then it was adapted into a short film many, many, many years later. Can you tell um, me about how that happened? The sort of nuts and bolts. Was it somebody who was in that building with you that saw it? Or how did that go? Well, yeah, actually. So I wrote the story. It's kind of interesting story. Um, this is a story called Bone Mother. And the story of this is, I, I, the reason I'm going to tell you the story is that it actually has a lot of things that writers should learn and this is was an instrumental learning story for me so I started to write it want to write it it's um a Baba Yaga meets Dracula story essentially that's what I'll say kind of spoiling it but never mind mm -hmm. and uh I had the idea in my mind and I couldn't get it to work and I went to a coffee shop and I heard Baba Yaga speak in my mind and I realized the point of view character was wrong I had tried to do it in third it didn't work. So I pushed it into first and it just like flew straight out. Perfect. Really good. And that was the week. I think it might have been the week Ellen Daslo was the mentor there. And uh, but anyway, all the mentors read the previous work that you had written. So whatever she had, she had seen it. So I went I, I knew this was a good story and I'd worked on it after Clarion and I started sending it out to publishers. Now, one of the people in my crit group had said, oh, I don't think it should be in first. I think it should needs to be in third person. And I was laughing in my head when he said this criticism to me because I was like, oh yeah, I know, but it doesn't work. And, and, and it might be the way he would write that story, but it wasn't the way I could write the story. And if I had not tried it that way first, maybe that would have thrown me, you know? And so Ellen had really liked the story. So, but I had been sending out the story to lots of different people. And I got a response from an editor who was very well regarded. And he said, yeah, I like this, but I think it should be in third person. I, I think it's in the wrong voice. And actually that threw me, like it really threw me because this guy was, you know, confident and everything and uh, well respected. So I, out of that kind of sense of maybe I was wrong all along, <laughs> I emailed Ellen and said, Ellen, I just heard from so-and-so. And she just responded with one email with two words and it was, he's wrong. <laughs> and can you say a bit about Ellen Datlow in your words? So that yeah, I don't yeah, Ellen Datlow is a very respected editor of horror and science fiction, but horror more now, and uh, so she's really knows her stuff. You know, she had already decades and decades of experience before I encountered her. But anyway, what she did out of that was she emailed another editor and said, "Mora has the story, and I think you might like it." And I sent it to him and like two hours later, he bought it. Mm -hmm. So I learned such a valuable lesson, which was stick to your guns, listen to your instincts. And that story, which was wrong, according to one editor in the morning, was sold with no changes in the afternoon by another editor. It was such a brilliant lesson to learn. It was like, 
you just have to get it to the right person. The other lesson there that you internalized, I guess, is reach out. Yeah. yeah. Ask people what they think. Ask people's help, because that can be such a hard thing to give ourselves permission for. I think that there are people out there that you can accidentally go, oh, I couldn't possibly tell them about this. Yeah. Or I couldn't possibly ask what they think. They might be too busy. Yeah. And actually what you did there is is one of the great life skills. You said, Ellen, who I know and who knows me, what do you think? And you use the contacts you have to swing to the next branch to make more contacts. Yeah, yeah. I think if I had just sat in it, I would have really doubted myself. And the reason I wouldn't, you know, I know Ellen more since then, um, but I, I still wouldn't say, oh, you know, Ellen's my best friend or anything like that. I mean, editors are editors. They've got jobs to do. And I don't like to, you know, there's that sense of I don't want to bother them, you know. But I just knew that she was familiar with the story. So she didn't have to read it to know. And she had told me, yeah, definitely put that story out. So, uh, yeah, it was. It, it, yeah. But reaching out to other people and asking their opinion can be very difficult because none of us want to admit we failed. That's a hard thing. But I will say this is the other piece of advice I was given very early with writing, which was common at the time, which is they said, you know, the classic thing is have a spreadsheet, keep track of all your stories you're sending out. And I remember someone saying, I don't know where I read it, but it stayed in my mind. They said, when you hit 100 rejections, you know you're on the right path, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> and I was like oh my god because when you start to see your hit rate versus like how many rejections you get versus how many acceptances when you start it's really low I mean and I'm no different to anyone else but what editors notice is persistence they will notice if you do the work and you keep sending in new work and they'll notice if you improve and your work will start to get more attention so I think there's a great deal to be said for rejection because you have to learn it. You have to learn it. And you also have to figure out it's not personal. It is not personal because I've been on the other end of it. I've been where I've had to judge work, where I've had to select work, and it is not personal. It is just to do with the work. And someone could send in a piece, like say I have a great piece actually, that I know is good and it goes into the editor and the editor says, I'm sorry, it's not for us. What you don't know is they could have had a story with that theme two months ago and they don't want another story with that theme. And that could be all it is. There's nothing wrong with your work. Wonderful. From that acceptance, how did you move forward? How did you make your writer life jigsaw from there? Yeah, well, I just kept... Um, plugging away at writing short stories and then over time more and more start getting published so people start noticing your work and then what started to happen is people start asking you to do things out of the blue and one of the things I was asked to was to write a comic which I just said yes to, even though I hadn't written one before. And I asked for some advice from a comic writer I knew. And uh, I just started doing it because I knew you have to say just yes. Just say yes. You don't have the confidence. You may think you might mess it up, but they see something in you. So if you say no to them, unless you've got good reasons now, by the way, uh, on the off chance, but generally you're kind of, disparaging their opinion of you so you even if you don't believe it you must go with their vote of confidence in you and I've generally done that in life where if I'm asked to do something even if I feel trepidation imposter syndrome all those usual things I just say yes and proceed and learn because it's a strange jump back but early in my IT career I was given this crazy promotion because I was in a small company from into like uh, full time work and into doing way more than I had ever done before. And I didn't have the experience. And my colleague at the time said to me, he said, Maura, just take the job. People will help you and uh, you'll learn. 
And learning on the job is actually the best form of learning, you know? So, uh, because, you know, you're really trying to prove yourself and you're working hard and you're you're going through a cauldron of <laughs> a crucible, I should say, actually. And you can get a lot out of that. And finding the edge of your comfort zone and people yeah. handing you projects you weren't expecting mm. and then you learn whatever you learn doing that and then the whole thing happens again. That's kind mm. of the magic, isn't it? And it's how your comfort zone gets bigger. Yeah, I mean, you really should be pushing yourself. Like that is something I try to do in my work where I will look for things I haven't done before. I will experiment. I will decide, well, I don't write in that point of view very often. And I will try to push myself. Now, sometimes that backfires and it's a lot of work and it's hard. <laughs> and you'll be going, why? Why did I, why did I challenge myself? <laughs> but in a way, that, that's an important part of it, isn't it? That, that yeah. too is part of expanding your comfort zone, that not everything yeah. you do is going to be the one. Yeah, yeah. There will be and, things uh, you go, do you know what? That's just not me. Yeah. Oh, no, indeed. Yeah, I mean... And then there's all the failed stories you've written or started and they just don't go anywhere and they fizzle out. Or then there's the ones that this happened to me where I had a story, uh, I was asked for a story and I started writing it and I hit this dreadful, it was like the story went off the rails from where I was mentally planning it to go. And I couldn't get it back on the rails. And it was really, really frustrating me. And I missed the deadline for submission for the story. And, you know, what can you do? The, they don't just ask you. They've asked loads of people. So this person wasn't stuck, you know, if you know what I mean. I had to sit with it. And then, like, two months later, I was able to grab it by the scruff of the neck and bring it back onto the rails and finish the story. And it ended up being... Actually, I think I put that in as an original story in my collection, but it was actually subsequently picked up by other, because you often get reprints of your story out of a journal or out of a collection. And, uh, or you get selected for the best new horror or one of those collections. You know, your work gets translated, which is all ha very happily happened to me. So, uh, yeah. You mentioned horror examples mm -hmm. there but there's also science fiction going on there's also other things going mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. what does mm -hmm. writing life look like now and how did you select or how did life select the main yeah pieces? I will say that I've always always had an obsession or a love of horror I mean literally from childhood the I've said this story many times but I was a young kid with a group of cousins and we were allowed to watch a late night horror film but it was black and white so I think they thought it wasn't scary you know mm -hmm. <laughs> but if you're like four or five <laughs> and it's just the right thing at the right time and it scared me and or troubled me anyway and I was like oh I want more of that <laughs> what was and the that's... feeling then what was what was the I want more of what did you want what I wanted more of was that sense of the weird, the strange, because actually this is just my personal interaction with life is life is very strange and weird. And so I, I like stories that have that element to them, even if it's not very strong, because that to me is more like life than what we would call mimetic fiction. I find it often quite flat and boring, you know, I'm like, well, where's all this other weird stuff? <laughs> Personally, I think that's why shows like, say, Buffy or The Vampire Diaries and Supernatural are really popular because they will have elements of soap opera and human dynamics and all of that. But then you've got vampires. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's like, I just want vampires in my soap opera. <laughs> yeah, which is reasonable. <laughs> yeah. and, and actually yeah. very um, proactive in a way that you realize what you want and yeah. and it it does seem talking to you that you've you've got a good instinct for i've worked out what i want i now need to make that happen yeah and so this realization occurred to me a few years after bone mother i think where i just went oh hang on even when i'm writing science fiction or i'm writing straight fiction or comedy 
there's this element of horror in it and 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 you know you are an expert you know this horror is a wide spectrum it's not just like I think every time you say horror to people they imagine Texas Chainsaw Massacre yeah. that's what they think horror yeah. is until the year I was published in it I thought I didn't like it because I thought it was all people's limbs falling off and boring exactly and in fact jump to jump back to the Buffy uh, supernatural analogy I can't tell you, Rachel, how many people have said to me, oh, I don't like horror. And then they'll go on and on about Buffy. <laughs> about and all I the go, horror they love. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. you know, that's horror, right? Yeah. And they go, oh, no, it's the, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, again, yeah. we're, we're about artificial labeling in our mind. And actually, it you know? does remind me of something that we've used the words proper and real about a bunch of things. Of, exactly. As we've been talking. And there is that kind of connotation of oh, it's not real horror if it's ghost stories, if it's gothic if yeah. if it's buffy you know if, if it's if it's not people's limbs falling off it's not real horror proper horror and we are talking about a spectrum it does remind me of conversations that i have with most writers about the fact that it can be very hard to go yes i am a real anything i am a real writer that we have some idea i think that reality will be what we feel and then behave and it's actually the other way around that if you turn up to the writing if you contact this person if you apply for this if you do mm. that if you do this if you do that you're walking the walk and your brain kind of catches up after a while our relationship with what reality versus perception actually is is so interesting whether we're talking about what we think we are as fans <laughs> Or what we actually think we are as career people. You know, you you are a real writer. You might also be a real. I mean, we know people who are nurses during the day. We know people who mm. are. I was talking about. I'm a coach. I'm a speech and drama teacher. I've been a director. You know, I. Mm. They're all real. Yeah. I'm curious about how you feel about this. In that, as you've got more and more to do as a writer, there become more opportunities for it to be literally all full time writer. Mm. and what that means for you and I, I guess what I realized in the conversations I'd had was that I'd I think I had either discounted the idea of me doing that literally full-time that I want there to be one-to-one -one clients and I want there to be groups where I'm coaching around things that are not directly writing and we know it overlaps public speaking mm -hmm. confidence mm -hmm. building all of that mm -hmm. but I do think I've at some level discounted the idea of me just being yeah. desk based slash sofa based slash yeah. you know every day and I'm, I'm just wondering what what that's like for you and whether that was what you wanted your writing life to look like yeah I mean actually that is a good question and I think there is this weird image in our head of the guy by the or the woman or whoever by the desk tapping away as this uh, symbol in our minds of what we're striving for. But it was like, for instance, I did a workshop last week via Zoom. And this is very common for a lot of writers. That's one of your jobs is like either teaching or like if you go to, like I did a presentation at a festival last year in Italy on writing a computer game which had started as a comic and then became a computer game. And I gave a presentation on that. And that work, that is work. That doesn't just like, you know, happen instantly. That is work that requires you to um, put a good bit of effort into it. So, yeah, I mean, it comes back to the fact that we are doing lots of different things all the time and we're wearing lots of different hats. Um, so, yes, writing at the desk is pretty much sort of what I was looking at but it's not the only thing and I have other ambitions like I long term would like to direct um that's one of my ambitions and I've been writing I also have a master's in screenwriting and I've done quite a bit of screenwriting so that is one thing I want to work my way into at some point I have a I kind of have a fixed timeline in my head of where that when that might happen but yes, so I personally think that writers today have to be very flexible and should not be fixated on these kinds of goals. If anything, what the world is showing us at the moment is the need to be adaptable. I mean, that is the number one thing. You have to be willing to try new things, work in different media. And that's another thing I've done a lot of, which is working in different media. I just like it. 
I think it's improved my writing. And then, you know, uh, like yourself, I started a sub stack and I've done a lot more. I don't know what you would you would refer to it as kind of general fiction, <laughs> more straightforward newsy fiction, or should we say creative non-writing? Uh, no, non-writing. <laughs> I like that, Sorry, actually. <laughs> that, that, is, that is incorrect. What I meant to say was it's creative so non-fiction. <laughs> and actually, I, I really love that term, creative non-fiction, because even non-fiction is actually fiction in a way. Like what is real? Yeah. We can really have a long conversation just about and that. If I picked up my magic wand and could change the way most people think about writing, one of the first wishes that yeah. I would make is that people got over the idea that creative just means you totally made it up because we yes. don't have that option. We have memory. We have imagination. We mix all the colours freely, whether we're knowing yeah. it or not. And when you talk about nonfiction or memoir, you know, one person's truthful rendition of one scene exactly. is not going to look like the truthful rendition of the other member of the family or friends or, or business yeah. or whatever it is in mm. the room at the time. It just isn't going to. So embracing the idea that we are creative storytelling beings I think it's very important you know off the page mm. as well as on it just acknowledging that about ourselves yeah I, I think mean, makes us healthier I, yeah I I actually wrote about that and not trying to <laughs> big up my substance do it do it <laughs> but I actually wrote about this very issue recently because I had encountered quite a significant block in my writing and there were a multi factors for it it wasn't just a straightforward issue it was like multi multi and I was writing, but with extreme difficulty. And uh, so I started, I had been reading Substacks for a while and I was, I had it in my mind that I would do it, but then I just got up in January and started doing it. I actually didn't gainsay the impulse. I just knew like in, in my bones, it was something I had to do. So I knew that instinct. I, I have good instincts in this area. And so I started doing it and I did it to suit myself with the idea of it's wonderful to have readers and subscribers, etc. But I just did it to as an expression, as a creative expression for myself, because I started I, I was trying to get back into the swing of regular writing. And in my mind, I had sort of categorized this as not a, not as important, you see. So I removed mentally, removed all the stress from it. So and then it actually only took me until I was about up into June to realize I had played a trick, a mental trick on myself. By removing the stress from this type of writing, I started to remove the stress from writing at all because I was having the classic problem of the desk had become the problem in my mind. It didn't matter what I was doing behind the desk or the typewriter, <laughs> typewriter, God almighty, <laughs> <laughs> who's ever, I don't have to, <laughs> anyway, laptop. Um, the, the typewriter that is in all our hearts. That's exactly right. The symbol Not, of the typewriter. Although we'd rather Jungian, die than use them. <laughs> yeah, the Jungian <laughs> archetype, which I think yes. is still a typewriter in everyone's yeah. mind, maybe a quill, a oh, quill or a typewriter, that's all it is in our mind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I had created this whole thing around it. So I had done this kind of, I described it as a dance of the seven veils over the five months, six months, because I'd started increasing the frequency. And then I started setting myself challenges in May. I'm doing a different one in June, and I've actually got one planned for July. So I've come back into the habit. And also I'm doing work without... A great deal of preparation, as in I'm just writing and allowing it to come out and not feeling fearful about it or second guessing it. And then obviously going back and editing it afterwards. But uh, it's gone very well for me. And actually, if anything, it, it has saved me because it was writing my way. I think I said this to you in a message, writing my way out of the problem. You but said right, writing something you said that I just I utterly loved was uh, writing myself out of an impasse yeah yeah and but that's only because I viewed this writing I had mentally segregated this writing mm. so that was good short term because it tricked me out of the problem but it's actually now I'm at the realization that I had made a real real fundamental error and so this is why it's interesting to discuss the silos we create in our life. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm at the point now where I'm like, 
whoa, as long as it's creative, it's creative. And even if it's art or crafting or whatever. And I do work a lot with photography and with art. And I find them fantastic ways to just clear things up. And I have multiple journals. I don't know about you, but I have like journals oh, yeah. for projects and, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and somehow, Rachel, that's not writing. <laughs> yeah. And that's not writing when it's a liberating thing to say to yourself is so, so, so important. But for me, that comes back to the soapbox I was on a minute ago, that creative realizing or acknowledging that creativity is how we storytell, is how we remember things. This mm. is why it's such an important life skill, because rather than panic, I'm in an impasse, what should I do? Mm. What you what you essentially did was what do I want this to look like? And you yeah. you can find your own solutions when you stop going panic, what should I do? Mm. And you go, what do I want the solution to look like? And this is why I'm so glad I have a performance background because this is Stanislavski. If yeah. you know what a character wants, you know how they'll say that line. If this line doesn't work, you know why it doesn't and you know what to do about it. You base mm. their movement, you base the thoughts underneath the lines mm. on all of that. And just everything is working out what we want and how to make it happen. So that coming out of the impasse and making your writing life look how you want it to it's not just for writing it's for everything it's for our careers yeah. personal lives <laughs> writing can just be for fun like I mean I know people who never want to make a career out of it you know it's a hobby it's it's something they do and they don't show it to anyone and that's perfectly valid you know nobody we don't have to you know show our work and of course we want an audience in some ways but Essentially, if it's a creative expression, if it's something you must do, which is what it is for me, then, you know, you need to get it out, but not being blocked off by, you know, oh, I haven't sold this story or I haven't, nobody's reading it, nobody's commenting on it, nobody's liking it, you know, you have to actually just totally ignore all that stuff. Mm -hmm. That's not the point of the, the point is the work. The point is to do the work and whatever you can do. To do the work is what you need to look at. Now, the problem is that we have many internal things, weirdnesses in our brain that can interfere with that, with that problem, you know, with tackling the problem. And the thing is, it's like I knew that writing was the right thing to do. I didn't need anyone to tell me that. And actually, that made it worse because I knew the solution was to write, but then I couldn't write. You know, it was like one of these, you know, a self-fulfilling prophecy and it was a real feedback loop anyway. And I just broke it by doing this thing on the side, which was just an expression. And then it, it's ended up being my saving. And that actually reminds me enormously of something else that you said when we were, when we were text noting each other about how one of the things that you had found as one of your own blocks was saying to yourself I'm not good at marketing and I've done that with poetry yeah. I've done that with I don't write poetry and then I had a, a combination of things happen one of which was Daisy Jones and the Six and I was really enjoying watching that and some of the songwriting tips that just sneak in throughout that I, I'd be I hadn't done it consciously at all, but they'd obviously been piling up in my head. And, oh, okay. And then my cousin is is a neo soul singer, and she and I were talking about people we knew in our lives, and something that all went on on the compost heap, as Neil Gaiman so beautifully has it. Yeah. And what then happened was the very next morning after our conversation, I voice noted Naomi and said. Um, I think I've written a song would you look at it and she said oh yeah no I'll totally give you notes and I sent her the song and then she said I have no notes that's brilliant I should have oh. known it was brilliant you're a writer as if it's ever that simple and we've been talking about that and that might be something that she performs at some point I looked at how much is left to your imagination and it's 99% of the story yeah and I thought oh all right then yeah <laughs> the opposite of a novel well, actually, that's a very interesting thing you've just raised, um, which is that when you're writing in comics, um, there's a, a very well-known comic book writer who's also written a book on writing comics and uh, creating comics. He's an artist as well as a writer. 
and it's called Understanding Comics by Scott McLeod. And one of the things that he said in it, which has remained with me ever since, which is he said, because obviously a comic is static images in panels. Usually, I'm being a generalist here, um, static images in panels that tell you a narrative. What he said is the story exists in the gutters. So the gutter is the white space between panels. Exactly. And that was like someone put a lock in a, a key in a lock and opened a door because I was like, oh my goodness, you know. And so when I when I write comics, I often think to myself, how much can I leave out? How much can I give the reader the opportunity to go into that white space and imagine the rest of the linking story? It's crazy when you think about it. And it also it tells you a lot about the kind of active participation that there is in comics versus maybe some other media. I'm not d dismissing others, but there's a sort of more of an active engagement going on in the process. And it, it's got text as well as the art. You know, it's a very, very interesting art form. Mm. We're, we're all, and I, I know I've heard myself say this before, but standing on the same wheel, that there are other categories but everyone mm -hmm. is looking at somebody else. I was actually talking to one of my favourite songwriters about this Latin Quarter that I grew up with. Mike Jones was on this podcast a few months ago and he looked at poetry the way that I would look at songwriting. Uh -huh. you know, and, and I've you know grown up with his lyrics and they're sort of in the soil of the world as far as I'm concerned. But for him, it's something else. And then for somebody in poetry, it might be prose. And we all just look around at each other and think that's a real one, but I'm not. <laughs> or that's, yeah. that's a somehow higher form of whatever. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then I'm just thinking about David Lynch. And of course, you, you, did, um, you, you did the Firewalk With Me monograph. Uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a kind of chapbook. Yeah, well, it was a dis discussion of his work from a person. I'm a huge David Lynch fan. Actually, I've learned a great deal from his work. And what I love about his work is it's very, again, we're coming back to what is horror. There are actually horrific moments in his work, but he's a brilliant master at is establishing unease. Mm -hmm. And that is the prelude to the horror. And that's what primes you for it. And But it's also a very troubling emotion. We don't like it. We want it to go. We don't like being made uneasy. And he's very, very good at that. And so. we also want the story to be clarified in the end. And he's very yes. good at not doing that. Yeah. And actually, the other thing I learned years and years ago from David Lynch is I've actually could write a, a mini book on what I've learned from David Lynch. Oh, <laughs> well, actually, let I me write the forward because I quote him every working day. <laughs> Go on. I might do a sub stack on what I've learned from David oh, Lynch. Gosh, actually, yes. It's a great idea. Yeah, <laughs> but, but one of the things is years ago, I mean, he has famously never explains his work famously and he just people will ask him questions the cows come home and he'll just look at them he'll say nothing you know he might make the occasional cryptic of course comment but he will not explain his work and in my opinion that comes from the fact that David Lynch started and is still an artist and he was used to creating canvases putting them on the wall and walking away and he never felt the need to explain his work. And I thought to myself early in my writing career, I'm going to take a leaf out of David Lynch's book and I'm not going to explain my work and leave it at that. And the other thing that he has said, in my opinion, more, more beautifully and accurately than anyone else need ever hope to is go where the fish are. Yes, so, I have that book. <laughs> and just for anyone who doesn't because they probably exist it's just so accurate that the ways in which we get in our own way are oh, go yes. going to the middle of the desert with a fishing rod and going I'm not getting any ideas where are the fish the fish aren't coming I'm a useless writer no <laughs> ideas and actually when you walk away from the stress and when you work out what the rivers yes. are for you when you go to the places where where the ideas are going to come to you because you are, your mind is open and relaxed and you are mm. not in a state of yeah. of fear and yeah. tension and it becomes a joy again and that's how we find our way back in yeah yeah you know, where the fish are and the other one is don't scare the fish away don't do yeah. the things that stress you out and push oh my god away. i can't believe we're having this conversation i can't believe i've forgotten these great pearls from mr lynch because i actually have the that little book in which he talks about this 
<laughs> there's blue fish on the cover of it it's his book about um creating it's really uh, typical of him images um lots blank page <laughs> and cryptic useful pieces of information but the interesting thing you say there about go where the fish are if you've decided that the fish a fish can't fly in the air you're in the, as you said go into the desert if you decided that the fish can't swim in the sand well your fish might yeah. you know, <laughs> do you know what i yeah. mean oh yeah it, it's again it's about creative possibility that you've locked yourself out of these things but that is such brilliant advice and i i remember reading that years ago um go where the fish are and don't scare them away which is what i've sort of learned to do re- just recently <laughs> again <laughs> If you'd like to spend more time at the writer's gym, head to the program notes for this episode's writing workout on white spaces and how to fill them in your audience's imagination. To visit the writer's gym in real time, visit rachelknightley.com.